thanks, Andreas, for that introduction. Um, I just want to speak about our pair of speaker, uh, speakers a little bit um, more in that um, we are super lucky tonight that both our speakers are experts, but they're also perpetual uh, experimentalists pushing the limits of 3D scanning technology, printing, uh, photogrammetry, while challenging these technologies to be more, um, I would say, inclusive um, in our understanding of representation, of value, of collaboration, uh, multiplicity, uh, and accessibility. Um, and in that, um, they're really building completely new frameworks and languages and spaces for architectural and design explorations. Um, so as architects, as we continue to enmesh and um, operate in our increasingly entangled material and digital realities, um, I don't think there's any argument that those two are <laughs> disconnected anymore. Um, we're working in and within and with these new platforms, um, new media, uh, new languages of engagements that's being produced every day. And there's uh, a new set of ethics of politics um, in the work that's produced in the way that it's being collaborated on. Um, so we're really lucky uh, to have both Carlos and Bika here tonight to really expand on their, uh, their work and to further this critical dialogue. So first up, um, we have Carlos Lucini Bayoid. Carlos is the developer of the Lucida 3D scanner, and he's worked on um, numerous projects um, sort of all over, including the documentation of historic sites, such as uh, the tomb of Seti I in Luxor, Egypt, um, art documentations for institutions such as the National Gallery in London, or um, Museo de Prado in Madrid, or Musée du Louvre in Paris, and many others. Um, he's also developed critical explorations and exhibitions around facsimiles, um, such as the tomb of uh, Tutankhamun in Luxor, um, where this really amazing, uh, this room, the Salle uh, Bologna and um, many, many others. Um, and then we will welcome Bika Rybeck, partner at Someplace Studio. Um, and through her really expansive scope of design work, um, manifest architecture, exhibition, curation, discourse, uh, teaching or software development. Um, I think she's crafting an architectural practice that is decidedly contemporary, um, producing work that collapses scales, collapses mediums, physical and virtual spaces, and really creating a new form um, or a new language um, or form of engagement via technology and again, collaboration that um, is sort of uncharted and therefore very exciting. Um, she holds, she wears many hats, but since 2017, um, she's been teaching tools for show uh, at GSAP, which is a series of courses and workshops that, you know, works with different students to create these um, different interactive prototypes for architecture representation. Um, so with that, we are really excited to see the work of Carlos and Vika tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I would like to say thank you very much, uh, Andres and Shoshi, for the invitation. It's been really, it's a pleasure being here. I was really looking forward to this event. And um, I'm really looking forward. I'm very interested on, on hearing Bika's lecture as well. Uh, should I start? I would like to, to say um, that uh, Andres is right. We've been having uh, many conversations in the last years, uh, both um, from the School of Architecture in Madrid and also now in GSAP. Every time I've been talking to Andres, I've been learning new things. And, and in a way I've been keeping, I've been trying to apply many of the um, approaches to, to technology that I was learning from his work as well as a, as a professor and as an architect. Um, I was trained as an architect. I am now trying to reinvent myself. I'm uh, becoming kind of, uh, interested in other areas, other scales of the profession of architecture. Um, and I would like to show you a little uh, samples of the work we are doing in the Factum Foundation. Um, should, I, should I try to share my screen now? Um, let's begin with an image like this. And um, I think it's very relevant, specifically for the moment we are 
living in right now. This is an image of the Museum of Louvre in Paris. It's kind of shocking to see an image like this uh, nowadays. Uh, probably we will not see something like this uh, scenario uh, soon because the way our relation with culture is changing is rapidly um, uh, modifying because of the different events related to uh, coronavirus, etc. These gatherings of people, this uh, uh, relation of um, uh, numbers and figures, numbers of visitors as uh, equals to success in culture, as, uh, as a way of valuing the success in culture is something that is rapidly changing. This um, thing is something that in fact we have been trying to uh, analyze and offer different approaches, different answers to how people should interact with objects, with uh, works of art. And I would like to offer a few examples of how displacements of um, values in culture have been happening through the work that we have been doing. I like to use this concept of displacement in the sense that certain values or certain meanings that we are usually applying to uh, specific objects through making copies, through making facsimiles, making exact reproductions of these objects, uh, these values can be uh, placed, can be relocated somewhere else in a different object. So it's about how we can make a shift between what's original and what is something else. So this image I was showing you before, this is a room in the Louvre Museum. All these people are actually looking at the Mona Lisa by Leonardo. And uh, as you can see, everyone is trying to get a good picture or a good selfie of that famous iconic image. But in a way they are giving their backs to a much larger and in a way um, for some time most important painting, which is actually the wedding at Cana by Paolo Veronese. That's the big canvas painting at the end of the room. And uh, because all the people are usually gathering to look at the, at the Gioconda, at the Mona Lisa, they are in a way ignoring this big painting behind them. But for some time, this painting was actually in this location. This is the uh, Refectory by Palladio in Venice, in the Monastery of San Giorgio. And this room, this uh, empty space, this is where the painting was originally located. So the artist, Veronese, initially thought this creation, this work of art, to be part of this architecture setting. What is happening is that now in Paris, since Napoleon took the painting more than two centuries ago and uh, put it in the museum, it is in a way neglecting its original nature, its uh, reason for being that specific subject and that specific painting. As you can see, this is, um, this is an image that shows how this painting used to be at the end wall of the refectory. This is where the monks gather to eat together. And this is why having the wedding at Cana, this representation of, uh, of a feast, of, a, of a, a gathering, of a festive gathering represented in the painting was in a way an extension of the activities happening inside the refectory. We were asked to do an exact replica of this painting in order to bring it back to its original context, to its original location. And this is what we had to do back in 2006 with the technology that was available at the time. The goal was to record the surface of the original painting without ever touching it um, with 100% non-contact recording technology and trying to capture the um, high resolution image of that canvas in a way that could be reproduced physically. We are not talking about the virtual recreation here. We are talking about gathering a proper uh, digital image and then being able to reproduce it physically printed on canvas the same way as the original would have been so that we could in a way um, rematerialize this image, this uh, um, digital file of the image, uh, but becoming part of the material reality in the refectory itself. So what happens, this is an image of the facsimile that we installed um, some years ago. 
the result of a uh, project, of an action like this, is that we are effectively uh, repatriating, in a way, it's an act of repatriation, bringing back something that uh, used to be in a particular place, but that was stolen. But we are doing something else. We are trying to demonstrate that, at least uh, in the way we understand our work, originality and authenticity are things that don't have to be associated to the same object. So this is the first displacement I would like to share with you. What we have done is something that uh, when people visit this copy, this replica in Venice, people don't uh, have any doubt that the original is the painting in Paris. But in a way, because we have the facsimile in this space at the same uh, height with the same position that the artist created to, with the daylight coming from the window where it should be at the right height without this golden frame, all these characteristics are making this object in a way more authentic. So we are understanding that even that the original, even though the original is in Paris, the experience you get out of looking at the facsimile is in a way more authentic. Bringing something back to its original context is one of the reasons why we make facsimiles. The way we do it is, um, and I will show you different examples now very quickly, it's a mix between digital technologies like um, high resolution digital photography, 3D scanning, photogrammetry, etc., in combination with um, craft traditional skills. So there's always this combination between the transformation of physical materials and also the transformation of digital information. This is an image of a very dif different place. This is in the Vatican in Rome, and this is the original. This is an image in the Sala Bologna. It's a private room near the private uh, apartment of the Pope. So it's a place that, unlike the painting I was showing you at the beginning, this is um, a place where visitors and tourists don't have access to. So it's a unique room. It has different representations of the city of Bologna that they were made in a kind of very complex, yeah. very intricate um, uh, conceptual yeah. framework. So it's, as I was saying, proposing different representations of the city of Bologna with uh, like a view of the province, like a map of the city. So what we were asked in this case uh, is to bring this painting, this uh, urban representation of the city completely out of its original context so it could be seen by the public for the first time. It's uh, in a way it's the opposite argument to the previous project. It's about bringing something completely out of its original location uh, in order to expose it to a different kind of criticism. We were talking about a place that is private, that it was made at the end of 16th century just to be enjoyed by the Pope Gregory XIII at the time. And now we are trying to recreate that fresco, that uh, wall painting, not only with color, but also with part of the texture, part of the surface qualities of the wall, in order to be installed in a new museum, the Museo della Città, the new museum of the city in Bologna. So it's a completely different approach to um, making this uh, work of art suddenly a more democratic or a more accessible um, element. This is one of the main advantages of facsimiles. It gives people a kind of more natural or more accessible access to works of art that otherwise it would be, let's say, impossible to visit, to enjoy, or to understand. But maybe the most um, useful reason or the best uh, um, reason why making a facsimile is when it can help to, pre to protect, to preserve the original work of art or the original monument. What we did in the tomb of Tutankhamun in Egypt is uh, something that was specifically for this purpose. This is an image of the original state of the tomb. We are talking about uh, the funerary chamber, which is not a big room. It's actually a quite narrow space. So when we started working in this monument, which is one of the most famous archeological sites in the world, we found that the um, state of conservation was very fragile 
painting was literally coming out the windows, as you can see in this image. So the first step in like in all the works that we do in Factum is how to record the color, the surface, and the shape of the object in the most um, accurate way with the highest possible resolution so that we can have first uh, a proper digital record of how that object is at that particular moment. But then we should be able to reproduce that digital information back into the physical world in a way that we are keeping the same character, the same level of complexity as the original. It's not about uh, trying to simplify anything. It's about keeping all the layers of complexity in this uh, complicated trip between the physical object to digital information and back to the physical again. We were, um, after digitizing, after recording the original monument in Luxor in Egypt, we had all this information of the color, of the relief of the walls, and we started building this facsimile in our workshops in Madrid in a way that was um, visually exactly the same as the original. So when we are making a full scale reproduction like this, a one-to-one -one scale replica of something, we are not trying to make it in the, in the same material as the original. Of course, we will not be doing this in stone, but we will be doing it in a way that from a visual point of view, it should be completely the same um, as if you were in front of the original monument. So this is why the back of it, it's actually like a set design, it's an stenography, because it's all about um, trying to restitute the visual qualities of the original. This project um, was complete when we could actually uh, bring the facsimile back to Egypt, because the idea was not making a replica to be part of a temporary exhibition or, a, or an itinerary show around Europe, etc. It was about bringing the facsimile near the original, um, actually uh, more, a little uh, more than one mile from the original monument, so people could actually keep going to Luxor, keep visiting Egypt and the archaeological sites, and have the opportunity of visiting both tombs, the original and the reproduction, and decide what is actually uh, the difference between them. It's a kind of a game that we are proposing to the tourist, to the visitor, because we want to propose facilities as uh, an idea of sustainable tourism. We want to uh, be able to protect the monuments for the future generations, but also to keep um, increasing and keep promoting visitors and tourism to the area because it's so important for the economy and for the social um, sustainability of the region. So we believe that facsimiles like this can actually uh, create effectively this separation between with what is the act of preserving a monument and what is the activity of visiting a monument. And this is another displacement that I think was actually happening since we inaugurated this facsimile back in 2014. Um, it is possible to combine these two goals, which are apparently uh, opposite to each other. Uh, it would be possible, let's say, in the future to close the original tomb to the public, if that's what the authorities want to do, in order to preserve it uh, from uh, further decay, but at the same time to keep bringing, keep attracting the interest of people to visiting the monuments on site. After doing this work, we realized that we didn't have the technology necessary to capture all the qualities of the surface of things. When we are trying to uh, reproduce the, the wedding at Cana by Veronese or the Sala Bologna or Tutankhamon, all those works were mostly focused on the reproduction of color and not so much on the reproduction of the surface, the reproduction of the texture of the object. This is why we started developing this system, the Lucida 3D scanner, which is um, development that we did in Factum, specifically dedicated to recording the relief of paintings and other low relief objects with a maximum level of detail, with the highest possible resolution, so we could understand a painting, not from the point of view of the color, but 
from the perspective of the topography, of the shape and the relief. When we look at a painting like this, this is a painting by Rubens that is at the Museo del Prado in Madrid. We are interested in capturing not only the color, but also what is the uh, surface quality that makes this object unique. And this is the type of information that we can obtain with this uh, 3D scanner. As you can see, the goal is that the scanner should ignore the color completely. Like if we were removing the layer of color, virtually speaking, and we were actually looking at the shape of the panel. In this case, this is a panel painting. So we could analyze all the cracks in the wood. We could actually understand the thickness of the brush strokes, all the different elements that are relevant to understand this painting as a complex object, not just as a, a two-dimensional image that can be part of a catalog, that can be part of a publication. We are talking about something that even though it's primarily a two-dimensional thing, it has three-dimensional qualities. We have been applying the Lucida scanner to hundreds of paintings since we started this development more than 10 years ago. It's, it's been applied to canvas painting, uh, panel paintings, maps, frescoes, uh, books, drawings, all types of objects. And in all cases, the goal was actually to try to make evident, to make visible all those things that you don't usually get when you visit a museum. When you are in front of a painting, what they want in museums is to show the image as perfect as possible without any um, defect, without any mistakes. So this is why you get uh, homogeneous and uniform light, usually, and you are in a way neglecting the texture of the painting, which is what makes it unique. This is, I'm showing you now details of a painting by Frangelico, the Annunciation, also in the Museo del Prado. This recording was done right after it was um, restored, after it was in a process of restoration. And uh, what happened here is that because we are understanding the relief of the painting, we are capable of um, uh, trying to communicate what were the original intentions of the artist when he was trying to create all these effects of light and shadow because of the texture itself. And this is something that you get when you are actually uh, using a 3D scanner to analyze a flat object like a painting. This type of approach to analyzing works of art, it's something that it's um, radically changing what is happening in art restoration and art preservation. It's thanks to recordings like this that you are capable of um, having a certain type of information that allows you to uh, leave the original object untouched. So what's happening in the recent decades, in the recent years in art restoration is that it's becoming more and more accepted to have paintings, to have works of art that are not perfect, that they don't look perfect, because actually uh, originality is more and more being understood as something that it's a, it's a dynamic process. It's not a fixed state of the object, but it's something that we are building, we are constructing every time. And um, this is at the core of the work we are doing with the Lucida scanner, understanding originality not as a fixed state of the object, but as a um, dynamic process that is constantly changing. And it's precisely this transformation which we have to understand as, uh, as part of the, um, of the natural aging of paintings and the natural changing, natural um, uh, modifications over time of the works of art. The, uh, the shift that the Lucida scanner is making possible is to see paintings in the way that I am showing you now in the screen. These are all different details of the surface of uh, famous paintings from different ages, from different times, different artists and different techniques. And um, we are being able to uh, extract all these uh, material qualities, but using them in a digital environment. And this is why um, 
we are so much obsessed with the surface of things because we really believe that it's through analyzing the skin of things that we can learn so much about the way these things have been treated over time, they have been restored and they have been changing specifically. But then the real um, displacement, the real change happens when we want to bring this digital information back into the material world, back into the physical environment. It is possible to recreate physically this uh, 3D information by different means, uh, like uh, 3D printing or uh, CNC routing and different uh, fabrication technologies that are capable in one level or the other of reproducing in different materials the type of digital information that are being gathered uh, in virtual form. One of the ways we are trying to show this technology to the public is through exhibitions like this one that is still going on in Bologna, in Italy, in which for the first time we are showing the surface of paintings just with no, with no color, just as white reproductions in which the relief is the most important thing to see and to appreciate. In a way, we are neglecting color and we are trying to paint new paintings only with the shadows and, and the effects of a raking light. And this is why the uh, Annunciation by Frangelico that I was showing you before, it is possible to be perceived uh, by the visitor under a new light with this new um, um, parameters so that when you are going back to a museum and you are maybe in front of, the, of a painting, uh, you are in a way invited to look for different things, to spend maybe a little more time in front of the, of the artwork, uh, trying to maybe look for different angles, try to look for what were the texture effects that the artist were, was trying to apply to this particular um, painting. Finally, to conclude, I would like to uh, extend this idea of um, changes between the physical and the digital and between the, uh, um, the, the scale of, uh, of microns to the scale of, uh, of something just uh, at a larger uh, size. In the work that we have been doing in Venice, we are going back to Venice now, and uh, trying to question how can we apply this uh, super focused look uh, onto the texture of things, but how can we apply this to the scale of architecture and even to the scale of the city? We were doing this experiment recently, and this is work we have been doing also as part of uh, GSAP's historic preservation program, how to employ different levels of uh, 3D scanning technology that have different uh, goals, different mm, means to achieve uh, their, their goals, and how can we interpret the city through the eyes of technology. So for example, when we are analyzing, when we are recording the island of San Giorgio, this is the island where uh, the wedding at Cana by Veronese is, uh, where was usually placed, we want to understand that uh, what are the levels of uh, significant change that are happening to the island because, for example, of the, the periodic floods that happen, the aqualta effects, for example. No? So uh, often the island, and as it happens with many areas in Venice, gets flooded because of uh, rising levels of water from the lagoon. So these effects of the water are actually being uh, leaving traces, leaving their marks, on the walls of the cloister in San Giorgio. And this is something that can be captured um, exactly the same as if we were analyzing a canvas painting, for example. The idea is, would it be possible to monitor these changes by recording certain areas of the island over the years, over the time, and then creating a possible uh, comparison between different records. And also when we are, for example, analyzing complex historic objects like the trophy wall in St. Mark's Square by the Basilica in Venice, uh, which is uh, collaged like a patchwork of different materials, different marble stones from different parts of the world. 
um, is it possible through techniques like photogrammetry, close range 3D scanning, etc., to create a proper archive of these stones and then monitor how they change over time? So this is this last uh, change, this last displacement of a scale, which we're looking at a micro level of things, and then how can we really expand this to a scale of the architecture or the scale of city? Um, this is actually one of the things I would like to, to share with you, to listen to your um, feedback about, and hopefully to develop a further conversation with you in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Quiet clapping. <laughs> Uh, do we just go one after another, or is there in between? Okay, okay, okay. Um, thanks so much, Carlos. That was really amazing. Wow. I mean, I I knew some of the work, but it was totally different to, to hear it from you, and also, especially the these paintings without color just are incredible. I really makes me wanna like makes me really wanna go to a museum tomorrow and just look at look at the details of a painting. All right, I am going to share my screen. Um, oh, and also, I'll also put this into the chat because there's lots of links in here uh, that might be useful to people. So some of you, I saw that there's some students in here. I uh, <laughs> know that I like to make this presentation with uh, Google Slides because then it allows people to also, you know, check out the links on their own or have to kind of document after the lecture to kind of go deeper if they're interested. And I only have one screen, so I don't see you. So if there's anything wrong with the screen or if you have a question, just shout out to me because I don't really see the chat. But you see a bright green window right now? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so um, I, um, you know, this was, this has been really, really, really good actually because I feel like I've been, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, doing scanning a little bit. It started off as a hobby and I'll walk you through a little bit how it kind of became part of my practice. Um, but making this presentation made me realize what an important part of my practice it has become. Um, because um, as you see very beautifully introduced me, uh, I, I am primarily, I am an architect and a practicing architect and have a firm and so this has really always felt like a kind of sideline of my work, but then, uh, you know, in a way, a very, a very satisfying one because it sort of starts to inform and become the work itself, um, especially in this past year when I feel like, you know, I guess my, my sort of side interest or my academic interest has also kind of caught on a little bit in terms of a more uh, popular, the popular imagination sort of like started to really, uh, you know, develop a need for this type of, um, uh, let's say, content in terms of scanning 3D and then the access to some of these things on the web, which is really what this lecture is focused on. And so I'll try to walk you through a little bit like my approach to scanning and then we'll all go into a web 3D model and actually look at some of those scans together in 3D. Um, I'll be posting the link at the end of the session uh, and so yeah, bear, bear with me with the kind of slides, it's going to get a little bit more interactive at the end. Because <laughs> it's also when you talk so much about interactive projects and this and that, you know, and then there's nothing, you know, the, the format itself uh, maybe should also reflect that. So um, again, scanning started with 123D catch. Um, anybody here knows that or heard of that at some point? Just shout out. <laughs> It's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it was an app on your phone where you could just take photos of things. Um, and I remember being in Italy and taking photos of fountains. And that was like five, six years ago. Um, and, you know, later I kind of um, started to get more into it. I don't know actually exactly how, but it sort of started to understand how that, that was really the kind of um, entry drug because it made me realize how easy it is that basically you just need a camera, really just your phone that you have with you to take photos, to take 3D scans of pretty much anything when, as long as you have good lighting. 
and good conditions, but I won't go into the technical stuff here. There's enough of that uh, online. Um, but the one thing that kind of fascinated me with scanning is this question of reality. And I think with Carlos, you know, you already, you already talked very beautifully about this idea of a replica and what, what is really the original, right? Like what is the authentic object versus the inauthentic object or what is, you know, the difference between really reality and virtual reality, which is, seems like such a banal question in many ways, but especially in this past year, it has become uh, more and more important actually, I think, to think about. And so as architects, we are already working with tools to create a future virtual reality, um, but we're actually sometimes less interested in documenting the reality to, to do that in a way, or we're, we're sort of maybe lacking the skills or the, the, the you know, means to do that really. Um, and then also, so, so I think, I guess I'm interested in this full cycle of like kind of documenting reality to produce reality, if that makes sense. So to put it into a different way, I, I really like to think of 3D scanning as a creative tool that allows you to, um, you know, create new types of content while still, of course, by definition, scanning as a, as a sort of technique, as a technology is a means of reproduction, right? Like even this event is called reproduction now, but so, we, uh, the media of reproduction has always been also a, a form of creativity. Um, and so, you know, photographs were seen as reproductions um, of reality and therefore had no copyright um, when they first, in the, the beginning of the 20th century. And so, you know, I think it's kind of similar with 3D scanning. I feel like there's actually a lot of authorship to that and a lot of ingenuity and a lot of ways of doing things and creativity, you could say. Um, but it isn't really necessarily seen as that. So people just yeah. So anyway, so 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 this question of like, what is that reality that you that you're producing with that scan and with these kind of works is, is something that's really interesting to me. Um, and so for this lecture, I realized you know I wanted to break it down because I feel like I had done all these little projects and I wasn't quite sure how to sort of structure them, and kind of came up with these five categories that hopefully help it help for you to understand um, the tools a little bit better. Um, so the first one, and that's really kind of the the origin in a way for me uh, was, you know, 3D scans or 3D models as a form of collaboration. So in a way that you could actually um, basically have a 3D model on the web and send it to somebody else and for that to be really easy. Because, you know, as we know right now, still people live, uh, 3D models live in very heavy files somewhere on people's desktop and then they get sent, they get zipped into folders with textures and sent on the transfer and then download it. And it's just like a very, very complicated way to do that. And so I was really interested, how can we sort of like bring in all these different data points, you know, the 3D model with all the metadata that comes with it um, and bring that into, into a web app. And so CC mentioned, web, you know, app development. And that was really what I tried for a few years. And this is the first time I'm talking about it actually for a while because it failed. So, you know, just starting with a failure right here. So it, it was a big idea and I was at New England, we got some funding for it. We, you know, I mean, most startups fail and this one did. And so it's okay at this point, I can, I can, I can share and be okay with it. And it's also because I think I've sort of catalyzed the knowledge from doing that into other things. Um, so here you see, you know, some news that came about. So this was some some content that we produced, thinking about it. But it was really helpful in terms of thinking about, you know, what can, how can we represent space on the web, and how can we think about scanning and sort of like reproduction of reality in this sort of interactive way where multiple people can work in a document at the same time. So the idea of this app, just to briefly explain it, is this like. You know, when you have Google Docs and you have all these people right now, everyone's in Google Slides and you can see other people kind of floating around. But the idea is that you have the same thing, but in 3D, but as a sort of like design tool. And so Mozilla Hubs, which is something I'm teaching now until for show and that we're also walking later is kind of similar, but it doesn't have the component of, let's say the metadata where it would actually function as a design tool. You're kind of just passively walking around. You can't really, it's, it's, it has elements of that, but it's, it's not, fully that idea. So nobody has built that idea yet. So if anybody here is listening and thinks that it's a good idea and wants to try again, <laughs> I'm like happy for, I want this to exist. I just realized I'm not the right person to actually go do it all the way. Um, so this was just some slides of that initial idea and, and some you know fantasies we had about it would become this archive for exhibitions where people could come in and, and really look at, um, it would be a design tool and then also an archive at the end where you would be able to kind of look back onto exhibitions and 
you know, relive them in 3D on the web. And just some mockups we made. So this was actually a working prototype that built like a, you know, we did some actual software development where, we, where the, the app was working. Um, but again, some things you start them and then they fail and it's okay and you move on to the next. <laughs> so um, the other, the other uh, kind of project with, that involved 3D scanning that actually evolved in a way directly out of that app uh, was uh, uh, basically, I call it the showcase section. So basically not so much the idea about designing or collaborating together, but really showing off certain objects in 3D on the web. And so uh, I got a grant to work with the Vizcaya Museum in Miami, a really crazy, beautiful place in Miami. I recommend if you ever get to go, it's a sort of Baroque uh, over the top villa. And they had this, they were just really interested in technology and how to engage uh, their audience with technology. And so we talked about different ideas and they proposed, oh, we have this case of old items that were you know, items of the owner and we don't really know how to contextualize them. They're just kind of laying around and we want to create, you know, an app for, for people to kind of learn more about these things. And so I was like, okay, great. I'm going to 3D scan and use this pre-existing technology that we built to, to build this app. And here we see this is another sort of fail. So I, I try, I scanned those things, but I wasn't good enough yet at scanning. And so I actually had to rebuild them all in low poly because I realized that basically, so here you see that the, the, the rebuilt uh, meshes because the actual scan would have been too heavy and would, would have crashed our apps. <laughs> again, again, a learning process, but uh, you know, and also a lot of these objects, as you see, are glass and glossy and shiny. And anybody who's in my class knows that this is very difficult or who has tried scanning. But you know, it was it was it was an attempt, and but the app worked, and we built it. We, we, you know, even though it wasn't quite the scans that we put in there, we we used all these photographs to actually construct the objects uh, kind of manually in 3D. And so here you see visitors using it, and so the idea was you had the actual physical case there, and the reproduction, the virtual reproduction, right next to it on a screen, and you know, really just put it up for a few days and kind of like observed it as, as a form of visitor testing. It was really fun. It was really cool to see people uh, sort of figure it out and see the relationship between the real objects and the virtual ones and read the descriptions. And there was also a game. So kids were the ones who really understood it best. And they just went ahead and tried to figure everything out about the app and play with it, versus grown-ups were often a little bit more hesitant about how to actually use it. Um, so semi-failure, I guess, here. And then uh, uh, here, uh, so that was, uh, kind of around the same time when I was also teaching an iteration of Tools for Show, the seminar, and this was uh, when we worked with the Intrepid, which is a big museum uh, in New York on, uh, on the West Side Highway, and it's basically a, um, uh, a military ship that has been turned into this aircraft carrier museum. And so on the right, you see on a beautiful architectural drawing, you see an exploded axon of that ship, and so we, we we worked actually with um, uh, Andres, uh, Jorge, Jorge Otero Pios from preservation department uh, in the school. And he was doing a parallel class that was about smell. And so through conversations with him, you know, basically we, we started kind of thinking about, oh, okay, we could scan parts of, of the ship. And that was the sick bay because the sick bay is inaccessible to visitors uh, during, well, just generally inaccessible because it is, so you know, narrow and hard to get to, as you see, it's really in the, in the belly of the ship. And so went down with students, and here again, it's kind of like a cleaned up version in that same app uh, that that you know showed you sort of like the, the overall layout of the plan. And then the students made these scans and built various apps and interactions with it. The actual review was on the ship itself, and so you know there was kind of like a mixture between. That semester was even, even some AR with MR, like all kinds of different things, but the scanning was also a part, an important part of these, of the documentation of these spaces. And uh, yeah. yeah, oh, are you guys talking to me or just making noise? <laughs> um, okay, here's some, here's some AR app that people made based on, basically there was a scan and then they, you know, put things onto the scan, uh, Kind of new 3D models onto the scan and develop a game, a game out of it as a kind of visitor engagement tool. And you know, the space is moving incredibly fast. So at the time we used Torch in class, and Torch uh, just 
they, they cut, like I said, they didn't exist anymore. They basically just closed shop. They got sold, they, you know, they got sold to a bigger company and now Twitch doesn't app them, like it's, it's just not there anymore. So it's really, yeah, the space is exciting because it's changing, but that's also sometimes frustrating because you have to kind of keep, keep learning and developing new things. Um, and then this showcase idea developed uh, further last spring um, during COVID when we had to kind of pivot the class into a different theme. And, you know, because suddenly we were, that was it when everyone really was at home, couldn't even leave. So people, students were scanning their, their spaces. Um, and so here we started to use Sketchfab and build these little scenes. Uh, I think it's linked on this link above. So if you can go onto the link and there's little descriptions and there's sounds. So people really built a little, they scanned their belongings, but then the, the idea was to kind of like create a little vignette, a spatial vignette of that moment of isolation or the moment of change. Here's a some uh, kind of took, you know, he had to move out of GSAP housing. So he just took a scan of all the suitcases. So it was a very emotional review, actually. It was very sort of like odd because, you know, it's, it's like a visual studies class. So like we all kind of looked at these moments and a lot of them were like bedrooms or weird, you know, situations. Obviously students chose what to scan. They didn't have to, uh, there wasn't specific things, but it was, yeah, it was a really kind of different side of scanning a different side of almost like a very personal side of, of scanning and then bringing that to life. Uh, and then another showcase project, and this one I'll actually walk you through in VR in a second. Um, so this was last winter, I went on a trip with my very good friend, Valeria Meyer, and she is from Argentina and is, um, we spent two weeks traveling through the Pampas in Argentina, uh, really like a very flat countryside and looking for the works of Francisco Salamone, who is an Italian Argentine architect in the 1930s in the, under the fascist regime, built a series of really incredible um, and strange and actually, you know, sort of un, un, kind of unique buildings that are really hard to pinpoint in terms of they're not quite modernist, they're not art deco, they're really kind of their own thing, but they're, and they're also really, really problematic because they were sort of built of, you know, fascist project of state building at the time, but now they're, they're kind of like the most extraordinary piece of architecture in, in this region. And so, and, but, you know, because it's so vast, the area, you have, you still have to travel hours and hours and hours between each of them. So really kind of on the trip, I mean, I, I had my camera, like, you know, as a good architect bringing my good camera, but then sort of while we looked at these structures, I realized, oh my God, these are perfect for scanning. They're so, you know, textured and they're falling apart. And there's also the urgency because they're really hard to access just physically. And also nobody's really taking care of them. They're, they're, there's a preservation moment here. And so, so I started to take, um, uh, you know, basically take photos for, for, to make scans out of it. And uh, then later when, when uh, Valeria and I came back, we built a website uh, that sort of, served, so she's also writing her thesis on these, on buildings, um, her master's thesis. And so within the, actually the Spanish literature department at Georgetown, so it's also a collaboration between sort of like an architect and a, a, a writer or, a, you know, a, a sort of academic, sort of academic writing with an architectural research. And so it was a really beautiful project in terms of like combining our interests and sort of visions into, into the scans and then into the website where, Again, the models are hosted on Sketchfab have little descriptions that we wrote together. And then there's a text on the website that explains about the buildings, why they're important. And we hope to make this into an exhibition at some point, you know, maybe with physical replicas or through um, VR versions of it. It's, it's, so here you see, I didn't, I didn't actually mention what those buildings are. So it's actually kind of, kind of dark. So they're, they're most of the, the ones that we went to visit are slaughterhouses because uh, he basically built most mostly slaughterhouses and uh, city halls, which is quite strange, but a strange combination. But those were at the time in Argentina, as a, you know, the country of meat, the slaughterhouses were the most important civic buildings in a way next to the town hall. And so, uh, which now has a very different meaning because they're all abandoned and it all got centralized. But um, you know, she's writing about this relationship between nature meets cattle, country, identity, and so on. But so here you see the tracks, the tracks of basically where the cattle was hung um, uh, from the ceiling. So um, 
Yeah, and there's something about these cans that even, you know, again, has, to me at least, it resonates emotionally. They're really, uh, they're, they're, maybe it's some part of the scanning aesthetic itself, like right? the artifacts that happens with scanning make it them look even more creepy. I mean, they were creepy in reality, <laughs> but in a way here, so like the creepiness of the scan matches the, or uh, yeah, matches the actual experience of being inside of these buildings. And here you see a drawing of basically, so scanned the exterior and, you know, we didn't have a drone, so it was all just how much I could walk around and then went inside and scanned the interior. So here's an overlay of two different scans that has an interior and an exterior and actually kind of creates not quite a complete, but a pretty good picture of this, of this building. And you see how precise it is because you can actually, you know, you can take quite precise measurements and there's very little, this one did have a floor plan, but most of these buildings actually don't have very little documentation. So it's also, can be a really interesting tool to actually create floor plans or, you know, further document, document buildings that are about to fall apart. And I'm dreaming of doing a trip like that in Yugoslavia where I've been and traveled around, but sort of there's all these abandoned buildings that are falling apart that need documentation. So anyway, that's, if anybody knows a grant, I want, <laughs> I want to try to do that. Um, so uh, yeah, so these were kind of like, I put them into showcase. I mean, obviously all these categories are overlapping. Um, documentation is another uh, area that, you know, here I talk about documentation in a little bit more dry sense, where it's not so much about, not so much about representing these things or putting them onto, on, into an exhibition or showing them to the public, but it's more like architectural documentation as in like site documentation. So this was uh, in the fall, I, my friend, bought a little house in the Catskills. And he was like, hey, do you wanna you know, be my architect and help me renovate it? And I was like, of course. And so I went up there and made a scan of the house just for the purpose of, uh, yeah, of documenting it and making it easier. You know, obviously once you, once you know how to do it, it's much, much faster than uh, going in and measuring all this and you have a much more precise model. So here's, an interior model and again interior and exterior are separate but then we combined and then because you know so here's some more images of this scan uh, because I need to use this kind of for architectural drawings these sort of messy meshes are not that helpful and so I'm showing this also to show this various transitions and ways that those scans are changing once they're made once they go away from the point cloud so here you see the cleanup model so I build a rhino model because that's what we're gonna be using to design things in and make drawings and so on. So, you know, kind of kind of transitioning it into uh, into sort of a different kind of environment and, and it looks entirely different. And obviously this, we could have built the same model from lots of measurements. So this was just a way to make it faster. The textures are mostly taken actually from the scan. So here are these textures and textures. So, you know, just basically taking a screenshot off the side and, and mapping it onto that. Uh, a plane. And so that does give the Rhino model a different kind of realism than if we would have just measured and put like any kind of wood texture on it. So there's, there's still, a, I still see this as a sort of hybrid model in a way that is, you know, if there's reality and there's kind of abstraction, it's, it's not, it's not entirely abstracted yet. It's still somewhere in between. And we'll be walking through these two as well. So we can actually compare in 3D how the effect is between the Kind of scanned one, and then the the, the Rhino one. Uh, so then another category is uh, I don't know if artistic is actually the right word, maybe emotional or sort of like more visceral um, as a sort of scanning as a as an experiment and how to create uh, uh, um, you know sort of study a little bit more free flowing study of space. So this is actually an upcoming uh, show that's going to be shown at the um, um, SIVA, Contemporary International Virtual Art. <laughs> I don't know if I can, so it's S-I-V-A Festival, and it's, it's opening in two weeks. Um, if you're interested, let me know. I, 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 I can post the link to it, but so it's, it's, it's a little bit in progress right now, but this has been actually a long-term project where we've been, I've been kind of always fascinated by, by foam, uh, like actually foam as a construction material, as insulation, as the idea, as something that is, you know, 
behind every wall and actually behind everything we're sitting you're probably sitting on foam right now but it's covered by something and you're probably surrounded by walls that also have foam inside so the whole idea of this project is to scan this foam that's sort of like hidden behind everything and bring it out to light and kind of like be immersed in this foam world in in vr so here inside of a foam package that was scanned and here and then there's also an exhibition that's kind of researching foam alternatives because foam is actually really harmful to the environment and sort of like thinking about mycelium foam and other kinds of foam. So uh, this is also linked to, you know, you can go in after and just explore and poke around it. But uh, here you see a little house and this house was actually also the beginning. So basically all these different models that are in this giant scene are all scans from that little interior that was in construction. So basically you could, the foam was coming out of the walls, you know, that everything was sort of open. And so, uh, uh, I think that's another really interesting opportunity of scanning and then also VR is basically you can change, you can play with scale, right? Like you can just, you can go inside of very small things and, or, or look that, look at very big things in a small scale. So scale itself, you know, I mean, there's this thing about art, right? Like most art is just like something scaled up without a lot, but <laughs> this, is, this is definitely just kind of a sensorial experience that is quite different. Um, and then this was uh, last year, actually also before lockdown with GSAP students uh, and Mika Tao from the preservation department, we three scanned an abandoned pub in, in Fidei and um, Andres was there. <laughs> or did you, make, yeah, you were there, right? Or did, no, I guess, you, no, but he didn't make it because it was locked. I think we talked about it and then, anyway, so there was, so this was, this is the scan, it's a laser scan, so you can see how nice it comes out. This is the space. Uh, and so in this in this space, basically, we just, you know, had it for a couple of months and did all kinds of scanning. So here was sort of, you see a different kind of scans you can make. So this is a detailed scan of that space of just like a random pipe that was there. And then of the bar that was done with photogrammetry. And this was basically an artwork I made and that was shown in the space. It was kind of like a meta work where space that the artwork is shown and is being scanned and is being kind of reproduced in itself. And even here it sort of uncovered things that you maybe wouldn't see. So there's all this gum underneath the bar and everything, you know, you see sort of this sort of surreal moments. And then you also uh, it looks kind of hyper real. And then when then suddenly the camera turns around and you can see the meshes sort of coming out. So again, sort of playing with sort of our, uh, I guess, emotional reactions to reality, hyper-reality and so on. Um, and those videos are also linked here. Um, and then based on that same scan, we also rebuilt the scan um, together with uh, a number of collaborators and co-curators. And so, and build an actual interactive website where you could walk through the space and experience the artworks, uh, you know, by, by clicking on them and then getting more information about each of the artworks. So again, you know, the scan was sort of hyper real as this laser scan in the beginning. So, I mean, you know, never perfect, but quite real. And then sort of this is a, a translation that was then used for a website. Um, and then finally, and I'm, I'm mindful of time. And I'm like, um, so finally world building. So this is really what the current seminar is very concerned with the conversion of food for show. It's this idea, okay, you know, we're, we're, we have, we take this sort of reality from the scan and then, but how, what, what else, what more can we do with it? And I think the foam world is sort of the beginning of that. It's sort of like, uh, you know, taking something pre-existing but then creating something entirely new out of it. So sort of thinking of 3D scanning as like assets or something that you have in your library and you can deploy for your designs, you can deploy it to build a universe on its own and you know in a, in a way as architects we, we are doing that but we often don't think of it as world, world building it's a term that comes more from video games and from you know really or, or from writing novels it's sort of this idea that we, we kind of think of every aspect of a universe and then try to kind of design for it um, and so kind of switching perspectives as architects and thinking uh, at it from like this sort of narrative point of view I think is really interesting because you start to think beyond you know you start to think about who are the people who are inhabiting it and you're you can design that you can you can think about you know the sounds the spaces and I mean this can get incredibly sophisticated we're uh, focusing on 
on Hubs because it's a really easily accessible platform. Um, uh, Mozilla Hubs is kind of like a web VR platform that's been developed for a couple of years, but really has, you know, become, I don't know, actually it's still not mainstream, I would say. It's sort of like become more mainstream <laughs> maybe in the last year. But so here you see a, a screenshot of an event that was just opened last week. Uh, uh, so my friend, Beatrice Galilee, uh, she curates this event called The World Around. And we talked about, you know, what we could do for it. And so, so we built the world around as a physical space. So here you see the map uh, of the world with all the speakers that were part of that conference. There are around 20 speakers that all speak within a day and have short presentations. I think I've read part of it at some point. So, you know, everyone has a kind of like a TED talk type of 15 minute talk. But usually it's in person, of course, and this year we're online, so we're like thinking about how can we create a space that can become a social space during the event so people can go hang out. So this was this was the space, uh, and you see the people moving around, and you see you know basically each speaker from the conference had a sort of uh, label and and was located on the world map where they actually were physically located at the time when they were speaking, um, and so in a way. The, the physical distances that were kind of that are imperceptible to us suddenly were made palpable because you actually as an avatar had to move over to you know go from Europe to Africa or something like that. So it was like a kind of uh, almost like a diagram in a way of space, but also yeah, it became sort of this uh, this maze maze like experience. And uh, the three D yeah, the three scanning aspect was here was really quite small, but it was. Um, it was actually, I think, the most engaging uh, one of all the different stages. So this was Ensemble um, is a Spanish uh, architecture firm, and they they were they submitted a three scan for us to include into our uh, it, you know we basically we, we just got assets from people, but they submitted a scan of the cave. The whole project that they presented was about this beautiful cave that they had uh, refurbished to become an apartment, and so. Here we uh, we basically took their scan and made that part of the of that world that people were able to go inside in in 3D. Um, and so I'll finish with actually the current student work, which amazed me because this was done after only two weeks of class. And so the idea is that people scan uh, their own locations where they are in the world, right? And so uh, which at the moment is everywhere. <laughs> And so they uh, they uploaded this to this platform, and we were able to walk around into in each other's spaces. And it was quite incredible because you know they they really uh, kind of created spaces that were you could you could really sort of imagine a totally different way of how. And as you see, those those scans are rough, right? They're not like sophisticated. They have to be some of them were probably much nicer before, but they have to be optimized. Um, because we uploaded them to the web. Obviously, if somebody would just screen share or show you a, re a rendering, you could make it a high, much higher resolution. So it's kind of like a trade-off, again, you have to make of reality versus accessibility. But so we're trying to kind of find these interesting moments where those two are, you know, where we where, where, where find kind of like a satisfying middle ground. And so this is a pen made a, uh, quite, a, quite a drone, and so he scanned this whole neighborhood, uh, which was really incredible. Um, and here, another one by Jordan, you know, who scanned a whole block in New York City, and we're able to walk around in that as well. Okay. Uh, how is everyone doing? Are you? I'm going to just stop sharing. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it was a little bit long, but is everyone still uh, ready to go into the into the pre-scan showcase? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here's the link. I'm just going to post it into. So turn your microphones off when you go into the world and just. Uh, talk to talk to us here if you're um, if you want to say something just talk to us on zoom not in the hubs world so when you go enter um, you know you say enter 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 and 
it's a bit heavy because there are three scans, so they're not super easy to load. So if it loads for a minute or two, that's okay. Just let it load. It'll eventually, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, be available. Um, okay, so I'll also screen share. reload myself because it's, um, I think it timed out when I was gone. Okay. Okay, so I see there's already a lot of people in here. <laughs> um, I'll give you a little tour. So if you're, if you're coming in, I am this sort of, well, you can see my name, I'm, I'm Bika. But if, even if you don't, See me, so yeah, people are already moving around very nimbly. So most of you are probably on your desktop. Um, if you've played video games at some point as a kid, you just move around with the W key, W keys, and then D to move forward, W move forward, D to move right, A to move left, and S to move back. Um, the tour starts in the three scan house. So when you come in, it's kind of like on your left side. I'm gonna go inside now. Yeah, um, and if you have a hard time getting through the door, just press the G button that turns off your gravity and then you'll be able to, oh, I should actually screen share this so it's recorded. Um, oh, uh, it's not showing on the screen, right? Um, Okay, I think it might be too much for the graphics card. Let me try one more time. Okay. Okay, now you can see it on the screen, right? All right, so, so yeah, so as I mentioned before, uh, this is the little house in the Catskills and I just uploaded the interior. Oh yeah, yeah, this is a little jacket with the screen share. Um, I think I might have to not screen share. <laughs> I'll just make a recording of that for, for posterity. Um, but yeah, so here, so here you can see all the mess that was there when we scanned the space. Um, you know, uh, there was a big couch in the middle that I kind of cut out just to be able to see the, um, uh, the whole space. And yeah, uh, the, the kitchen is there with all the things. I mean, this is again already quite optimized because it was um, uh, because it, 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 it's uploaded to the web. It looked quite a lot better in the original version, but you know, it's also, it does look like a little, a little bit creepy, I find, because it has um, the kind of scanning artifact. And then when you go into the next one next door, I'm gonna just press the G button and fly over. Hey, Cece. <laughs> Okay, yeah, here's there's a bunch of people in here already. So here you see, this is the kind of clean space, right? It's like a totally different environment. Uh, in a way, it's, it's, it feels more comfortable actually. It's not, doesn't have the kind of creep factor and it, yeah, sort of works, works a lot better. Um, and then, so I, I think that, you know, the, the maybe most interesting one really is the, the Matadero. Uh, so it was, a cloudy day, which is always the best, the best way to actually um, scan anything. I see all of you are floating in there. I'm gonna stop sharing screen and just walk you through it and be there at the same time. So um, yeah, that works a lot better. Uh, as you can see, it's it's abandoned at the moment. 
Um, and you know, if you float above, you can also see that basically the scan really is just from the side. So actually, if you if you walk around on an eye level, it's a pretty convincing kind of scan. But if you walk kind of if you float above, you see all the things that are missing. And the main thing is that you can go inside. So um, the uh, uh, and, and you know the in between is actually not scanned, so you kind of see the backside of the front and the backside of the interior space. So that one is the most sort of surreal space that you can go in. And then the interior space isn't as nice in terms of quality, but it gives you a pretty good idea in terms of like how how the space looked like. Um, and yeah. The last one is more for fun. So this was kind of like, you know, the, 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 the sort of surreal moment of scale. So I scanned this sort of mushroom, mycelium mushroom. And, uh, and if you press the G button, you can just go inside and then be in this like incredible dome space. So I found it kind of cool because it's sort of architecture, uh, kind of un unintentional Baroque architecture <laughs> when, you, when you look up. Uh, and it, you know, it's really just a, a tiny sort of mushroom that was grown in quarantine in the in the first few months at home. So it was like this size, and suddenly it becomes this like really big dome. So it's sort of like three scanning as a kind of, I would say, emotional expo exploration of <laughs> of geometry and materiality and so on. Um, yeah, and that's that's it. Sorry for not being able to screen share. Well, thank you so much. Amazing talks, uh, really great, um, and so many many topics uh, and questions and 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 discussions that we can have. I think that uh, I mean we can do it. I don't know. I hear myself. I think I'm both in the in Zoom and in. Let me close the. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> So uh, uh, thank you so much, Vika uh, and Carlos. Uh, it was it was amazing, and you framed this uh, discussion in an amazing way. Uh, if anyone wants to unmute and make questions, just do it uh, normally as we do. Also, you can write them in the chat, and we can we can read them. Or uh, uh, but I, I'd like to start with something that uh, it's connecting both uh, presentations. And when Carlos was talking of these displacements. Uh, uh, you went to a series of uh, moments in which, you, in which you were reflecting of how objects multiply, how objects relate to context, how by displacing from one context to another, uh, there are operations that are critical that have to do with uh, the material durability, with the way that they're socialized, with tensions that could be repaired, like uh, this process of repatriation or multipatriation. And in a way, we could read this uh, in two ways. Uh, one could be uh, that the, there's something like an object and then it's, uh, let's say, uh, replicated, let's say. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, there's also a second possibility that comes from both presentations, which is thinking that the contemporary uh, notion of an entity, it's multiple, uh, it's uh, transmaterial, uh, it's something that is loaded political, uh, politically as it travels from one version of itself to other, from this process of multiplication and reconvening of the multiplication, contextualized, multiple context, contextualizes, uh, uh, contextualizing processes, uh, 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 objects uh, operating simultaneously in different critical grounds by this multiplication. So, uh, what we were, uh, the, and, and that's something that we were experiencing here very clearly. We were both at the Zoom uh, and we were at this uh, Habs Mozilla space. We were also multiplying ourselves, like, right? We were thinking of these avatars. So, so my question is this, I, I have the feeling that what you showed us today, it's how we inhabit, uh, or how we're part of forms of, existen of existence that are shaped by multiplication, by this multi-medium, I would say, uh, quality of objects. And it's there precisely in the way that these multiples are uh, relating to each other or constructing uh, any entity as, as um, uh, let's say, ambivalent, as uh, multi-located. It's where basically entities operate politically. 
uh, I, I know this is kind of a long thing, but but I, I think this is crucial. It's basically a fundamental change in the way we relate to the connection of objects and context, in which basically you would be saying that the, the objects and the context are kind of uh, bodied in this process of multiplication. And I think that that's, that's a fundamental change from uh, uh, the, for instance, the way that modern architecture was operating in Euclidean uh, spaces or in which uh, we would imagine even reg kind of uh, 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 regional contextualism that was also very important at GSAP at the moment. So all this is, is kind of a totally different way of thinking of objects, right? Um, Vika, you want to, or should, should I? No, go ahead. Um, I, I like, thank you, Andres. Um, and I would like to, later, I would like to comment on Vika's lecture. I, I enjoyed it very much. So thank you for your presentation, Vika. Um, uh, Andres, you are completely right. I mean, we are talking about um, uh, ways of multiplying uh, not only the object, but the experience we have of the object. And this is very much related, in my opinion, to the technology's capacity to activate these multiplications. So uh, very quickly, as an example, when this uh, famous um, essay by Walter Benjamin back in 1930s, when he was like saying um, copies are, well, I would put it in a way very simply, copies are fundamentally something that has less value to the original because you are not in front of the original. So you cannot experience the aura, this kind of uh, mystical experience. You can have only, uh, in front of the original. Maybe that is because the technology of the time was actually not capable of uh, doing representations or reenactments of an object in, a, in an efficient way. Uh, nobody, on the contrary, with a different case, nobody complains when we uh, um, go to see uh, uh, the play, a Shakespeare play, for example, that is being reenacted over and over again, no one complains that this is a, a reproduction of something that is not the original, because the reproduction we are capable of uh, put in play, it's kind of very efficient by itself. Uh, so this idea of copies, it's also related to the copiosity, like this copious idea of that something, if it's uh, worth, if it's valuable enough, should be and must be replicated multiple times. Yeah, I, um, I have so many thoughts right now, but the, I think, I think one, one way to frame that question, and I think Carlos's work touches on that very much as well, is this idea of access, right? Like um, museums, I think, have long been aware of the need of access, but it, it was often too complicated or expensive or difficult to make things actually more accessible beyond the people who are physically able and they're, you know, like uh, able to come to the museum. And so I think what the pandemic showed us also is suddenly we're all physically disabled from coming to the museum. And so it sort of created an urgency for access and maybe not even enough still, you know, but we, 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 we learned that we can change our protocols actually in a way that can be more inclusive and to sort of multiply ourselves in ways that can be more accessible. And I think that's a big, question right now in terms of you know the, the future of that like how, how how much of that can we harness for for whenever things are back to normal um and i think you know with with some of the projects of factum art that they're doing are really they're doing a sort of very refined service to that because you're you're creating access in a way that people are not even aware <laughs> because they, they, they maybe don't, it's so perfect that it doesn't even matter necessarily if they're looking at the original to them or it does. I don't know, it's kind of like a, I think that's an interesting question, right? Like the, if we're talking about all around these questions, but I think, you know, these, these very, I, I think with access, it comes to sort of, yeah, it comes that, that it's a complex equation in terms of like how, what does, how complicated is the multiplication of different things and how much uh, quality or loss of quality do you accept in order to make it more accessible? So I think that's always, uh, that's a political question that you're talking about, I think, to me, or that's how I understand it. 
I mean, I, I want to open up. I'm sorry. I want this everybody else to ask a question, but I think from that conversation, you know, in terms of multiplicity, it's almost like if the um, the other versions, the multiplied versions of ourselves or of whatever it is, has you know, you you basically now there's like a certain threshold of technology in which technology is able to produce rights to the multiplied copy, so to speak, that you know, different versions of ourselves cannot have, say, in, you know, my form as uh, myself sitting in my apartment versus uh, a copy of myself, you know, in this Zoom meeting versus a copy of myself in Mozilla Hubs or whatever. And it's, I think as you sort of really start to explore these platforms, there's so many interesting ways to expand access, but also really to create like new sets of rights and, um, and um, in politics that start to cross between these different copies of ourselves. Um, and that's where it's super exciting. But so maybe, maybe that's may. more of a, yeah. Sorry, you wanted to. No, no, no. Uh, thank, you, thank you for your comment. I think that, for example, what, um, what museums are realizing right now with the pandemics and cultural institutions in general is that they didn't have the proper digital assets to actually attract people uh, to other experiences uh, beyond the actual visit to the building, to the museum. What I like very much about Bika's uh, work, for example, is that she's um, exploring the possibilities and the limitations of the 3D technology to actually engage with um, objects of interest. And um, this is something that I always like to remark that the act of 3D scanning something, it's an active uh, act of how you perceive and how you actually um, um, understand that object, because all the decisions that you have to take all the uh, different strategies that you are putting into action when you are planning the scanning of something. There's a lot of decisions you have to take about how you interpret that thing. And that is um, filtered by your uh, cultural um, understanding of the object, about how others value that particular object. And this is why understanding documentation, not as a previous act before doing something, uh, but as the act, as the action itself, to actually interpret and communicate and share that particular object. I think that that's very interesting. And it's also part of what uh, we do and what Bika was doing, I think. I, I have two follow-up questions. Um, so the first is on the question of multiplicity. And um, I wonder if the multiple can ever reduce the value of the original. Um, that's one question. And then the second question I have um, is in terms of, um, we mentioned cultural um, cultural um, differences. And I wonder if, if you've, you seem to have like, both of you have seemed to have been all over the world. And I wonder if you've seen um, different um, responses to the, the multiples and, and the originals, the digital, the replica. Um, yeah, I can I can definitely speak to that. I mean, it's um, so the question can can it ever uh, affect the original? I mean, absolutely yes. But I think what I think that's sort of like the preconceived idea that there's an original uh, that should not be copied and that is actually put into law through copyright. Um, I think what we sometimes what is that, what is actually less intuitive or maybe counterintuitive is that copies authorize the original. So, you know, the more copies you have of somebody, the more you've seen something reproduced. And I think it's very self-evident when you think of social media. If you, see, if you see something multiplied a million times in a photo, you'll have more desire to go see it. And so it actually kind of elevates the original even more because it's been replicated or copied so many times. And so, you know, even, yeah, with I think there's there's lots and lots of examples where actually the inverse is true and where the copies uh, kind of authorize the original. Or if you think of fashion, you know, when you, when you have a very expensive fashion brand, uh, they pretend they don't like the copies, but the copies are actually also a compliment for them. So if, if their brand wouldn't get copied, that would actually mean that something is wrong. So it's sort of, you know, there's there's a kind of economy of original and copy and the, the copies are kind of holding up the original. In terms of cultural approaches, absolutely different ones. I mean, in um, there's a really interesting by Bianca Bosker where she 
basically talks about sort of different approach to copying in China in terms of like the copy being seen as an art in itself or as sort of culturally sort of seen as something that is um, a good reproduction is just as valuable as the original in, in a sense. And so she talks specifically about architectural copies and the sort of phenomenon of sort of copy cities. And, um, you know, there seems to be definitely a kind of different notion very right, generally between sort of the idea of uh, the East and the West in terms of like how they see they see copies. And I think a lot of, but even, even in terms of, even within, you know, each of these cultures over time, it has changed. I think copies and the, the kind of obsession with authenticity, the original and the author is also something you could say relatively new within architecture and within uh, Western culture, so to say. So it's those, 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 those terms and definitions and cultural ideas are constantly shifting, I would say. And even within myself, right? Like thinking more about copies, they have shifted too. So it's, yeah. Absolutely, and um, it's also, I think, very quickly, um, a matter of, uh, of the quality, because um, copies is something that it's been happening in, uh, let's say, in Western civilization forever. Like the Romans were copying the Greeks, etc. Uh, the problem is where, when, for example, in industrial uh, times, we were understanding a reproduction as a kind of serial reproduction, in which it's, um, lowering the quality of what you are reproducing and therefore associating uh, copies are a simplification of the original. So when that happens, that could be in a way diminishing the, the um, uh, significance and the value of the original. But when you are trying to do either a virtual or a physical copy, that is not a simplification, but it can carry all the weight, all the complexities, the character of the original. Um, there's no way I can see you are uh, doing something different than putting, like adding value to the original. Well, maybe this is the moment to close this uh, event. Also, Carlos must be quite late because you're in Madrid now, right? I am, yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm perfect. So we can do as you want. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. It was an amazing discussion, really, really uh, 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 thoughtful and challenging for the way that we, we think of materiality, context, uh, architecture. And, and also, I must say, uh, it brought uh, to me uh, uh, a great energy, uh, the fact that you've been developing these tools uh, and that you, you part of your of your endeavor, it's uh, it's also developing all the tools and questioning the ones that you use, and um, it's it's I mean it's, it's quite exemplary and 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 uh, and convincing the way that you've been uh, working. Uh, well, thank you very much, and uh, maybe CSC, you want to close the. the... Uh, sure. I mean, for sure. I mean, I'm just going to echo Andreas for thanking both of you guys for sharing your incredible work. The conversation could really go on all nights, but we'll 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 let people off uh, into their own Zoom copy version worlds elsewhere, and um, we hope to. The know, other multiples continue. of you are, are going to exist now in the other space. Yeah, <laughs> recording will be online somewhere one day, and you know, forever. Anyhow, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>